Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 10th of February. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 13th of February, with me, Michael Hewson. It's been one of the, it's been a bit of a strange week actually this week because while we've seen new record highs for the FTSE 100, um, we've seen the DAX try and push on, and we've we've seen the S&P chop around quite significantly. Um, it looks like that we actually could finish the week down on the gains that we saw from the previous week, which seems a little bit bizarre when you think about the fact that th three, three days this week, we've seen the FTSE 100 put in new record highs. But I think that, that sort of ties into an awful lot of the indecision um, when it comes to central bank interest rate policy and that indecision was no better illustrated in last week's payrolls numbers. Now, when I recorded last week's video, obviously we didn't have sight nor sound of those of those payrolls numbers. Um, and they were just wow. I mean, 517,000 new jobs were added in January and the unemployment rate fell to the lowest level in the US since 1969 at 3.4%. So there's no question that the US labor market still looks pretty tight. And certainly I think what we've seen in bond markets certainly reflects that new narrative. And markets are slowly starting to wake up to the fact this is Friday's payrolls report, that candle there. Um, on the Thursday, in the wake of the Fed meeting and the, and the Powell press conference, two-year yields hit their lowest levels since back in September. Uh, so not only did we hit a four-month low um, the previous week, but we're now back at levels that we saw back in November at 4.5%. And I think slowly and surely, markets are waking up to the fact that hey, guess what? We're not going to see rate cuts this year. And the Fed may well have quite a bit further to go when it comes to raising rates, something that I've been saying for quite some time. And, you know, I've been scratching my head as to why the NASDAQ has continued to hold up fairly well. Um, but certainly I think this week we are now starting to see some evidence that the messaging is trying is finally starting to get through it just makes powell's i think reticence and his nuance all the more puzzling when it comes to outlining a path for future interest rates but certainly what we have seen this week from a number of fed speakers um, on wednesday we got fed vice chair john williams echoing powell's comments but he also went a bit further. He said that rates might need to remain restrictive for a few years. Now, no Fed policymaker has said that before, certainly not in such clearly defined terms. And I think that that is significant. He was then followed by Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, who reiterated his own comments from earlier this year that the Fed needed to see a terminal rate of 5.4% before a pause, while both Governor Chris Waller as well as Lisa Cook followed up with hawkish comments of their own. So the impact on yields has been fairly significant because we've held on to the gains that we saw on Friday, as well as the gains that we saw on Monday, and we're back at 4.5%. Now that is significant. I think if we can move through 4.5%, then it's going to be much, much harder to justify valuations on um, US markets, particularly in the tech sector, because the tech sector, despite the fact that we've moved quite a bit higher on the two year, continues to hold up reasonably well. But I think what's significant about that more than anything else, particularly if we look at this chart here, is how well this fib level has held 12,850. It's a double fib. Um, so basically, we've taken the highs of last year, the lows of last year. We've retraced 38.2% and 
and it's been a fairly decent level. It doubles up on both sides of the equation, going from the lows there to the highs there, and it's 38.2 there, and it's 38.2 there. So it's a significant, it's a significant obstacle on the upside, and we do appear to be starting to roll over again um, over the course of the past few days. I think the big question is whether or not we start to see a a move back towards these sort of areas around the 12,000 level. And I think the only way that is going to happen is if US yields continue to edge higher. And I think that's one particular area of the market that I will be keeping a close eye on, not just the two year, but also slightly longer term in terms of the five year as well. Because while we've seen a sharp move in the two year, um, the, the moves at the slightly longer end, while they've been pronounced, they, they are, the yield on the five-year, for example, is at 3.88%. So it is still quite a bit lower. So I'd want to see that gap start to narrow. And at the moment, it's still, it's still widening out, particularly on the twos, twos, fives, twos, tens, um, as markets start to price out the possibility of aggressive cutting over the course of um, over the course of the curve. That's not to say that we won't see cuts in 2024. We could well do, but certainly I think to be pricing them now is a little bit premature. Certainly given the fact that oil prices seem to be having seem to be struggling to go lower, even as natural gas prices are continuing to find the air quite a bit thin are, and are continuing to drift a little bit lower. So uh, earlier today, we saw fourth quarter GDP out of the UK economy came in at zero percent. Um, so on a, on a technical basis, the UK has avoided a technical recession, though I think the nuance of that will be lost on an awful lot of people who are struggling with the cost of living, whether you see zero percent growth or a plus or minus 0.1, I think is neither here nor there, but at least it gives the politicians room to say, we're not in recession, um, even though it probably feels like it to an awful lot of people. Having said that, the fact that the UK economy is probably um, not in recession um, against uh, all the predictions of the OBR and the Bank of England, yay, they got it wrong again. Um, that's not to say that we haven't got a significantly difficult quarter coming up. Actually, a, a, a significantly difficult first half of the year, given the fact that we got a whole raft of tax changes coming in in the April budget. And um, AstraZeneca earlier this week um, touted some of those tax changes as the reasons why they decided to locate a, um, a new office or a new laboratory in Ireland and not in the UK, something Pascal Sorio, the CEO, made a particular pointed mention of. You know, and this is, I think, <laughs> this just highlights perfectly, um, you know, the the economics, almost the economic illiteracy of the current government. You know, if you raise taxes, yeah, okay, the percentage headline rate may be higher, but a higher rate of nothing is still nothing. And ultimately, it's better to get a smaller percentage of something than a higher percentage of nothing, but it's something that politicians of both sides appear completely at odds with. Obviously, the talk this week has also been increased windfall tax or, or you know, increased windfall taxes and all the oil majors, all predictably boring. Um, and um, But nonetheless, we've seen the FTSE 100 continue to make record highs this week. And despite the initial um, the initial open slightly lower. The, the, the FTSE does continue to look fairly resilient. And, you know, despite the um, fairly lackluster economic outlook, I still see plenty, of, I, I certainly see no reasons why the FTSE 100 can't continue to benefit um, at the expense of some of the more highly valued areas of the market. Certainly, we're, certain, we're certainly seeing that in the earnings numbers that are coming out, particularly in some of the bigger cap stocks um, like AstraZeneca, like BP, 
and and like Shell, but we're also seeing very decent recoveries in the likes of the airline sector, so or the travel and leisure sector. So um, in the 250, the airlines have been the biggest, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest gainers so far year to date. Companies like Wizz Air, EasyJet, obviously IAG, who own British Airways, Intercontinental Hotels, Carnival Cruise Lines as well. So travel and leisure sector um, has been a, has been a key beneficiary um, of this recent rally in markets, and it's notable that. In the GDP numbers that we saw this morning, that tra travel and leisure, support services, and what have you, contributed 14.8% growth in the Q4 GDP numbers, um, which is a fairly decent tagline if you want the economy to grow. Book a holiday outside the UK um, because um, that will help the economy. Um, so yeah, as I say, that's a that's a that was one of the key numbers that sort of stood out for, for me. So I'm still of the opinion that we can head towards um, the 8,000 level in, in over the course of the next few days and weeks, um, particularly given the fact that the pound is probably not going to be um, that strong. We could certainly see it move up to 125 and 130, but certainly on a historical level, it is still at fairly, fairly low levels. The only thing that would cause me to revise my outlook for the FTSE 100 is a fall below this key area of support through here at the moment. Um, the dips that we've seen thus far have managed to stay well clear of that, and I'm hopeful that that will continue to be the case. Um, looking at the DAX, we've started to see a little bit of a slowdown there. Um, certainly, a negative. Certainly, looks like a negative week. This is a little bit worrying. This little doji here does appear to suggest that above 15,600, the air is a bit thin. Um, so that could see us dip back to 15,000 in the short to medium term. But overall, again, the, the trend very much is um, positive from the October lows. So again, no reason to um, push back against a buy the dip narrative when it comes to the DAX. Euro dollar, we've seen a big fall in Euro dollar over the course of the past week from where we were last week at the moment, holding above the 50 day moving average. Um, that, is, that is acting as a fairly decent area of support. So keep keeping an eye on that. Um, if we do fall below the 50 day moving average, then we could see a little bit of a slippage back to 106.20. Um, but um, given where we are at the moment, we could see a bit of dollar strength, which could bring us back all the way down here. But certainly on the basis of this price action alone, um, we've got resistance at around about 107.80, 108. So that peak there and also that low there. So keep an eye on that particular level, 108, 108.20. If we can get back above that, then we could re have a retest of the highs. But at the moment, it does look at, it does appear that um, the 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 euro is a little bit range bound at the moment. Similarly, the the cable the cable found support on the 200 day moving average and is currently being capped by the 50 day moving average. So again, um, 200 day moving average has currently supported the move lower from the peaks that we saw at the end of January. Keep an eye on that area of support around about 119 and a half, 119.80. Um, if we can if we can hold above that. And there's no reason to suppose that we can't continue to push higher. But what is interesting is while the 200 day moving average is still falling, the 50 day is starting to roll over. So that is an indication that the market is becoming slightly more undecided about the future direction for the pound. Um, in terms of euro sterling, particularly given the fact we've got a whole host of UK data coming up, um, UK CPI. UK unemployment, UK um, uh, wages, UK wages, which are due out next week and are likely to give us an, a, a distinct insight into whether that wages inflation gap is continuing to narrow. It has been over the past two or three months since the October peaks of inflation at 11.1%, but certainly not fast enough for my liking. Um, looking, looking at Euro sterling, we've seen a bearish reversal on the Monday. We have started to drift lower. That's encouraging. 
um, but we we could we could be susceptible to a little bit of a pullback towards 88.70, 88.80. Um, but with euro sterling, I think it's still range bound. And you know, while we have squeezed higher and we have made higher highs, um, we ask we, we could well we could well retest these two moving averages here, which basically supported a previous move lower. So range bound on euro sterling. But again, here it, it does look a little bit of a buy the dip trade on euro sterling. So um, looking ahead, I think um, US CPI is going to have a huge bearing on what happens to the dollar next week. It's been it's been trending lower for several months now. Um, Jay Powell, Fed chair, has pointed to disinflationary trends playing out in the US economy. And I think that was part of the narrative that an awful lot of people latched onto, disinflation, not deflation, disinflation, but I think an awful lot of people were conflating the two. Um, you know, it's no surprise that we are starting to see inflation slow in the US. It peaked in the summer and it has been coming down slowly ever since. Now, you know, the December CPI fell to 6.5%, core prices fell, to 5.7% from 6%. It's heading in the right direction. But I think if anything, as you know, if, if the markets have taught us anything is, you know, don't try and front run the Fed too much or don't try and assume what the Fed is going to do too much because that Friday payrolls report has really upended the apple cart. And it wasn't just about the um, employment report on Friday. It was also about the ISM services report prices paid there are at 67.8 well that's well north that's well north of the 50 um uh, stagnation level so there is still significant services inflation in the us um, wages also still appear to be looking reasonably resilient so on a month-on-month -month basis we're still expected to see a fairly decent us cpi number of around about 0 0.4, 0 0.5%. Now that won't mean that we won't see a slowdown in the annualized number. I think we'll probably, it's being predicted that that will slow to 6.2% from 6.5. Core prices are also expected to fall further from 5.7% in December to 5.4% year on year in January. But again, that is still well above the Fed's target rate. And I think whenever you see these numbers, that's what you've always got to bear in mind. Any prospect or thought that the Fed will be cutting rates this year, I think is wishful thinking. And certainly the reaction of the bond markets this week over the past few days has certainly reflected that realignment in market expectations when it comes to the Fed rate path. The message finally appears to be sinking in. UK CPI. Base rate's now at 4%. And I think the attention at the moment is turning to when the Bank of England might be likely to signal a pause. Well, certainly, I think the Treasury Select Committee earlier this week, which saw Andrew Bailey, uh, Sylvia Tenreiro, and Jonathan Haskell testify to MPs, highlighted how much fragmentation there is on the MPC. Sylvia Tenrero even went as far to suggest that she might be disposed to vote for a rate cut, um, but she didn't actually specify when. Now, you know, I'm all for diversity of views and not um, indulging in groupthink. Absolutely. But a rate cut? when headline CPI is at 10.5% and it's likely to stay above 10% next week when the January numbers, I mean, really? I mean, that just, I mean, that, that just beggars belief that an MPC policymaker could think that with headline inflation trending at above 10% and grocery price inflation at 16%, that somehow cutting rates to push the pound below 120 and push up import prices is a good way of trying to keep a lid on inflation. I mean, it, 
I was sitting shaking my head in disbelief. Fortunately, it's a minority view, which I think is only probably shared with, una, with one other MPC member. So it's unlikely to see the light of day, but certainly I think if she does vote for a rate cut, that could certainly be perceived as dovish, even if it doesn't carry a majority. So CPI expected to fall to 10.1% in the January numbers. Unemployment is expected to remain steady. That's due out on the 14th, Valentine's Day. And wage growth, we're expected to see further increase from the current 6.4% um, rolling three month number for December. So it's UK CPI for January. It's the unemployment and wages rates for the rolling three month period to the end of next year. We've also got US retail sales, as well as UK retail sales. We've got US retail sales for January on the 15th, and after declines of 1% and 1.1% respectively in November and December, with the December numbers, I think, affected by the cold weather, we are expecting to see a bit of a rebound a new year bounce in January for US retail sales of 1.7%. So I think if, if we do see that and we see a fairly resilient CPI number, that will reinforce the narrative of higher yields or stickier yields in the US and potentially go further to undermining um, the idea that the S&P and the NASDAQ continue to rally in the way that they have been over the course of the past couple of weeks. UK retail sales for January, it's hard to make a positive case. Obviously, we've still got strike disruption, we've still got rail strikes, um, we've, we've, we've got NHS strikes, we've got ambulance strikes, we've got um, border force strikes, civil servants are going on strike, the teachers are going on strike. I think it'd be easier to list the people who aren't going on strike than the ones that are. Having said that, the last quarter of 2022 was a poor one for UK consumers, with November and December retail sales seeing sharp declines of 0.5 and minus 1% respectively. Um, it's a little bit surprising that the, the December one was so steep because um, even if you can't go to the shops, you can always order online. Having said that, with, with Royal Mail on strike, you, you're limited in the number of options that you have when it comes to delivery. But nonetheless, there are third party uh, delivery services out there that you can use. Um, the GDP numbers do show that um, we, the services sector um, did certainly save the UK economy in Q4. Certainly, I think as we head into the new year, um, the, the economic environment is going to continue to, to remain challenging. So I'm not really expecting anything um, mind-blowing or earth-shattering when it comes to UK retail sales for January. On the earnings numbers, there's only really um, a couple of items of note to speak of. We've got Barclays and NatWest Group as they announced their full year numbers on Barclays on the 15th, now West on the 17th. Now, cast your mind back three months ago, and the profits that these banks were making were prompting calls for potential windfall taxes on banks. Not content with the oil companies, they're now looking to look at the banks now that um, net interest margins are improving. And the banks are now, after a decade of underperformance, are now starting to turn their business models around. Now, there are plenty of reasons why, um, you know, banks invite criticism, but ultimately, without the forbearance of banks during the pandemic, um, the UK economy probably wouldn't have um, come through it, perhaps, as well as it did do. And ultimately, banks still have to pay their staff. So they need to be able to make a decent amount of profit. And let's not forget, now West Group is still 48 owned by 48% owned by the government. So dividends um, will benefit the exchequer. So you know, they need to be a little bit careful. And banks also pay higher rates of tax than the rest of the business. Only the oil, only the oil patch pays more. You've got corporation tax going up in April to 25%, and there's a banking levy on top of that of 8%. So you've got an effective tax rate 
next year of 33%. At the moment, it's 27. So Barclays four-year numbers. Let's have a quick pre-see of the bark or preview of the Barclays share price. And we can see here that we may well have seen a bit of a short-term top in the Barclays share price. That certainly looks like a doji candle. Thursday on on Thursday actually yeah it was yesterday and it's been a bit of a mixed bag the last 12 months of Barclays um, the shares dropped to an 18 months low last October since then we've seen a fairly decent rebound it's faced challenges over litigation as well as governance issues operating expenses is going to be a key metric they're set to rise to 16.7 billion pounds operating costs um, we're up 14% during the last quarter, Q3, and profits after tax for Q3 rose by 9% to 1.7 billion. Year to date, Barclays profits are down 19%, largely due to the fact that last year saw profits boosted by the release of loan loss provisions, which flattered the numbers. Now, an awful lot of banks now are adding these back over concerns of debt defaults and uh, late payments and what have you. So that's certainly something to keep an eye on. But certainly net interest margins have improved. And certainly there's been no indication, obviously apart from the mortgage wobble back in October, that banks have been underperforming. In fact, Alison Rose, CEO of NatWest, um, actually made a point of saying that she, at the moment, the banks weren't seeing any significant evidence of consumer distress. So. That's going to be interesting to see whether or not that messaging changes when they release their full year numbers on Friday next week. Q3 numbers were a little bit disappointing um, because NetWest reported an increase in loan loss provisions, as well as concerns that a further windfall tax might be levied on profit. So, as I say, keep it, keep it, keep an ear out for that. Net interest margin has improved significantly to 2.99 in Q3, bringing the net interest margin year to date up to 2.73% from 2.59%. On the business side of things, net loans have looked steady throughout the year. Um, they were up to 192.8 billion in Q3 from 188.7 billion in Q2. Um, that was mainly down to new mortgage lending. Now, new mortgage lending is likely to be a drag in Q4. Um, we're certainly seeing that played out in a slowdown in the housing market. For um, the full year, NatWest said they expect total income to be around £12.8 billion, with net interest margin expected to rise to 2.8% for the full year. But certainly if we look at this, there's a nice trend higher. Fairly decent support in and around 295 300p here. But again, you've got to be a little bit careful that the chairs may be a little bit toppy. Certainly, that was the uh, that was the big drop um, in October, and then we had the uh, the earnings drop back at the end of October there, but it was very really short lived, and now we're quite a bit higher from the lows back in 2010. So, um, yeah, bank 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 earnings, bank profits outlook for Q1, Q2, likely to be more challenging, but certainly profit margins are looking better. And we to finally finish off, we got Centrica. Um, who've upgraded their profits um, twice in the last six months. Uh, certainly on the basis of the increase in oil and gas prices, they up their EPS forecast from 10, 10 pence a share to 30 pence a share. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of um, what sort of picture they 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 paint against a backdrop of um, some really negative headlines about the forced prepayment, you know, forced installation of prepayment meters. So their profits are likely to come under scrutiny as well when they release their full year numbers on the 16th. So that's it for this week. As I said, just a quick summary, UK, US CPI, UK wages, UK and US retail sales. Going to be, I think the key, um, potentially key market moves when it comes to yields and what have you and particularly US markets relative to European markets but I don't, I don't think anything much has really changed in the wider scheme of things more constructive in European markets than US markets and um, so the key macro items this week UK UK um, 
UK inflation, US inflation and, and bank earnings. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets. Thank you for listening.